here. So, hey, what's up? This is Raymond Tyler from the Ivy at Soul Connection Tasty D's, 4th and South, right here on South Street in Philadelphia for another episode of Digging in the Crates. We got a special, special guest. All of our guests are special. But this cat, this, this, this cat right here, man, uh, like myself, uh, live and breathe hip hop. Have uh, been to a lot of a lot of the shows, but uh, you know we I shook hands with Jeff a couple of times and learned a couple, you know, spin moves from him. He's been in the studio with Jeff and Jill and all of them. So his name is producer Darren Henson. Uh, we love you with Soul Food. Oh, thanks. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but you're not that Darren Henson, right? Nah, I get mistaken for him a lot though. People actually, yeah, the family members have done it. You trying to look? No, nah, right. nah, but before they knew what he looked like, I had an aunt that uh, called me up and was like, and Saint was on the phone on TV talking about you. And I'm like, I didn't work with them. She was like, they said your name, they said your name. And I was like, it's not me. Did, did you know who he was at that time? Nah, not then. Oh, but eventually, I, I met him. And I, he's really cool, too. He is cool, dude. Yeah. So, so not that kind of answer, but be that answer. And if you've been watching Digging in the Crates, you know how we do. We go through some 12 inches and albums and stuff and give you our thoughts about them. And then the first one we're going to deal with is a little joint by a gentleman named Jeff Towns and Will Smith called Parents Just Don't Understand. When you see the 12 inch Parents Just Don't Understand, what do you, what do you think about? Uh, I think about the first time I heard the song and and how funny it was, because even off the first album, like one of the less known cuts was, uh, I think it was called Just One of Those Days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was, if you've ever heard that record, the stories on there are hilarious. So it was just more confirmation of how great a storyteller Will is and how comedic he is with the pen. Right, 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 right. One of the things, first of all, me and you worked together when, when this album came out. And I won't say where, but. Um, we used to, you know, I can remember sitting in the cafeteria with you, Sean, you know, you know, watching Yo MTV Raps and uh, Rap City with the mayor. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> Chris Thomas. Chris Thomas. And, uh, you know, just saying, you know, you know, one day. And now, you know, yeah. here, here we are. But even going back there, the thing I kind of remember is that Will, like few rappers before him, had this relationship with the camera where he was a natural, right. you know, and he went from there to doing, um, remember he, he had the uh, 1900 number, 19990? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think everybody had one of those. He was famous and you had a, a hit record out back then, you had a 1900 number. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely remember uh, parents just don't understand. We you your co-star, and that's how L.A. was. I think what's hot about that, though, is that they put a lot of Union Square on it, too, because... On the B side. Yeah, on yeah. the B side, because, I mean, for us, you know, back then, Will used to catch a lot of flack because people would think, you know, oh, he's, you know, the, the worst thing in the world was to be successful in hip-hop on a pop level back then. Right. So Jeff was always the, the street credibility, so what, because of his incredible turntable skills so good. Right. Live in Union Square, and it was probably one of the best, you know, demonstrations of turntable skills ever on wax. It's like that's incredible that they did that. So, right. well, I'm going to ask you more about Jeff and his turntable skills in a little while. But in the meantime, I want to move on to this twelve inch right here that uh, Thad actually talked about in our first digging in the crates episode. Public enemies, you're going to get yours with. Uh, Rubble without a fall is actually on the B side. Yeah, B side wins again. B side wins again. So, what are your thoughts when you when, when you when you think about Rubble without a fall when you hear when you hear that drop? That I still you I still play that record before I go into the gym sometimes because it's just the, the energy still stands up today sonically against some of the best records that are out. And if you like from how we get into records, yeah, I broken down all the elements like I have all the re individual records that they use to put this record together right. and when I look at the various sources that all these records came from and seeing how they gel them together 
and make them work sonically. Because I mean, you can yeah. sample from five or six different records, but to put all these things together and sonically have them work yeah. to a point where harmonically they work together yeah. is incredible. Like these guys, they used to say they put noise together, but they, they put it together and it made it musical. Yeah, I, I, I saw an interview with Chuck one time and he was talking about Rapper's Delight, the first hip hop record. And he had commented that, you know, that record's like almost 10 minutes long, the uncut version. And he said when he heard it, he actually marveled at how short it was as opposed to how yeah. you know, most people think that's a long record. But if you if you know about putting records together, um, you know, he marveled at how short it was. And just based on what you said, that's one of the things that always intrigues me when I hear this record. All the different sounds that you have comprised into, oh, I don't see the, the, the time on here, but not even four minutes, I don't think it was. Yeah, it's just probably you know, start, you know, from start to finish. Now, you gave me some interesting information online because I wasn't sure who the opening uh, voice was of uh, Brothers and Sisters. Yeah, it's Jesse Jackson. It was Jesse Jackson. Yeah, it's off, uh, it was a concert at, in Watts, California back in the day. And it's on, it was on Stax Records. And it's a, actually, I have it at home. It's a, um, like a two album set. And it's like the whole concert is just on vinyl. And that's Jesse Jackson talking at the beginning. Oh, okay. It's on video too. It's okay. probably on YouTube. Okay, yeah. and uh, I'm sure like the, the, the bass beat is Funky Drummer from James Brown, yeah. which, and you know what, I have to have you back and talk about Funky Drummer. I need to get you and Nino okay. both to, to discuss that joint. Right. It, it, for the longest time, that was like the, 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 the basis of, of, of almost a decade of hip hop play. Yeah, in the 80s. It, yeah. it was like, like a rite of passage. Like you had to incorporate funky drummers somehow to get on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you, you could barely tell it's funky drummer through the way they sample it. Now, um, how about the horn or what it sounded like in T Kettle? Where did that come from? That's off uh, the, one of the James Brown spinoff groups called the JBs. Okay. It's a record called The Grunt, Parts 1 and Part 2. And it's the opening. Uh, riff on the record and actually if you play that backwards it's the main riff for Terminator X of the Edge of Pen. So they used the same thing over but just did it in reverse. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How did they get it? Did one one of James Brown records does it sound like a T Kevin yeah, or it sounds exactly the same. Yeah. yeah, I can remember the first time I heard this, I was in at the uptown complex and somebody had it on their gold box. And we just stopped because we thought that their box was broke or that the tape was breaking. Right. When we heard it. Yeah, yeah. Everybody used to like try to figure out what it was. I mean, we thought it was like a teapot or, or, or yeah. something. Because they we knew they did crazy stuff as far as sample, but nobody knew what that was for the moment. So. Right, right, right. Um, as a producer, how well do you think the uh, Josie Love sample works toward the end of that? I think it, I think it works well, actually, because it's like, I mean, Bomb Squad hands down to me still one of the, I put them Molly Maul, the Bomb Squad, like best ever in hip hop. Like to, to carry it like they did and, and to establish themselves sonically. I mean, it's 2010, we're still talking about the Bomb Squad. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of producers in that era that have come and gone that you probably have to think hard to remember, but instantly you know who these guys are. And they, I heard the Rolling Stones wanted to work with them at one point, and they were like, nah. Wow. So that's big. That is big. I wonder why. I love the stones. Okay.